Backing up a little bit prior to the release of the Whisper of the Worm mission in July, we'd get our first look at the fall expansion for Destiny 2, Forsaken. It was revealed to us yet again with another Bungie livestream, beginning with a brand new Vidoc. If we take everything we learned from Destiny 1, including the expansions like Taken King, take everything we learned from Destiny 2 on top of what we've learned from the fans and the players, put that all together in one package, uh, we think that's what Forsaken's gonna be and we're super excited about it. The Vidoc began showing off one of the new destinations, the Tangled Shore, a Wild West inspired extension of the reef and filled inside the area a new enemy type, the Scorn, who bared resemblance to the Fallen, but actually a lot more unique than anything we'd seen before. Siva and Taken were absolutely great additions in Destiny 1, but the Scorn appeared to be much more unique. They would be led by seven Barons, the leaders of the Scorn. We'd get a brief tease about the setup for the story, a prison break in the Prison of Elders, and Cade 6 would be involved. Next, we'd get a look at some of the sandbox and core system changes. The weapon system was being reverted back to the Destiny 1 weapon system, but expanded on, allowing three shotguns if you wanted. Players could already imagine the combination options. And on top of that, random rolls on weapons made a return from Destiny 1, and new additions to masterwork options which would bring more investment back to the weapons. Supers were up next, nine new ones were added. They looked so good, and it's clear fun was in mind when designing them. A new weapon type was added, combat bows, which who can be mad at that? Everybody loves bows in video games. Then we saw Gambit. The hype levels were very high for this. PvPvE is something we've always wanted in Destiny, and players thought if we ever saw it, it would be something like the Dark Zone from The Division. But Bungie surprised us with Gambit, and it looked even better than we imagined a PvPvE mode looking. Slaying as fast as possible in the PvE, and defeating opponents when invading for PvP. Next we got a look at the new raid, which Joe Blackburn cited having the most bosses they'd ever had in a raid before. And it was set on the new destination, the Dreaming City. An area that would also be an endgame patrol space filled with secrets and lore to discover. Similar to the Dreadnought. They also explained that the Dreaming City would be a dynamic destination, affected by players' actions in the raid over time. We'd get a look at Collections, the next major quality of life improvement to the game that showed all your previously obtained weapons, armor, and vanity items, as well as acting as the exotic kiosks from Destiny 1. Triumphs were added which were like permanent record books from the past, and extended to each destination and activity in the game. Titles for those triumphs were added to the game to show off your achievements under your gamer tag. And most importantly, the Vidoc ended with Bungie saying that Forsaken is being made for the players who love Destiny, those who play it the most, and that pursuits for those players would be the focus. The rest of the reveal stream expanded on those sentiments. The developers were taking the feedback they'd received during year one and addressing all of it in major ways. Endgame challenge and pursuit would be a big focus for the Forsaken expansion. And towards the end of the stream we'd even get a hint at what would come after Forsaken. Cue the annual pass. Three separate releases throughout the year. Less story focused like Curse of Osiris and Warmind, and instead would be endgame focused. Building more long term replayability into the game as the year goes by. We'd get very few details besides that, and their names would be changed for the full releases to be called Season of the Whichever rather than these DLC style names. The stream would end with a look at the 2.0 update which was filled with quality of life changes. Fast back forward a few months, past the Whisper mission and Solstice of Heroes, and September 4th would arrive. The Forsaken launch was here. Forsaken brought us a brand new, very large campaign. It had five unique missions which is roughly the same as previous DLCs, However, the campaign also included six more missions in the form of Baron Hunts, where we would be hunting down various Scorn leaders and these missions took us to unique locations and could actually be pretty tough thanks to their higher power level. And a few of these Baron Hunts were filled with some awesome storytelling contained within each mission, like the Mindbender learning how to create his own throne world. Each mission of the Forsaken campaign was well varied, taking us all across the Tangled Shore and wrapping up with a few final missions on the Dreaming City. The story in Forsaken was a massive step up from Vanilla, Curse, and Warmind. The E3 2018 trailer spoiled a big part of the storyline by showing us that Cade 6 would be killed, 
but I can't deny that that trailer definitely sparked a lot of interest in player's return. I know it did for me. And as the story began, the prison break in the Prison of Elders ensued. Cade 6 or Hunter Vanguard would be killed by Aldrin Sav, and we were hell-bent on revenge. A very simple revenge story plotline that would evolve into something much bigger. In our quest for revenge, we learned of the Scorn, the undead fallen race, how and why the Scorn chose to follow Aldrin, and deeper lore surrounding the Awoken race and the curse being brought upon the Dreaming City by an Ahamkara wish dragon. All of this story had much more connections to the Taken King story from Destiny 1 in major ways. And honestly, you could exclude Red War, Curse, and Warmind from your memory, and the Forsaken campaign would fit perfectly as a sequel to the Taken King. Forsaken in general finally felt like the sequel to Destiny 1 we should have got from the beginning. Aldrin being possessed by Riven, Marasov's absence until the post-campaign questlines, and new characters like Spider, a fallen gluttonous crime lord, who was a total badass, and more interactions with a fan favorite character, Petra Venge, who just like she did in House of Wolves, steals the show once again with another great performance. Losing Cade 6 was tough, but his death set the tone for the expansion. Forsaken was not just a revenge story, it was a return to the tone of Destiny 1. The grittier, high stakes narrative was back in Destiny, and after Destiny 2's very adolescent storytelling in its first year, the return to this style was a welcome one. Forsaken brought four brand new strikes. The Hollowed Lair, where you slay the fanatic Fikrul, Aldrin Sov's right-hand scorn leader. Warden of Nothing, which had us returning to the Prison of Elders from Destiny 1, only this time much more expanded upon and fleshed out. Warden of Nothing was the ultimate homage to the area we loved from Destiny 1, and because the campaign all began with the prison break inside this Prison of Elders, it tied in perfectly. The Corrupted, which was a Dreaming City strike that unlocked after the world's first completion of the Last Wish raid, where we would free another tech witch, Sedia, from her Taken Corruption. And lastly, the Broodhold strike, which was a PS4 exclusive. In this strike, we'd venture deep into a crashed Hive warship, destroy the nest inside of it, and defeat the Brood Queen. All of these strikes were top tier, a major improvement over anything in Destiny 2 at the time. They were full of so much story, intense gameplay, and were massive in scale. Two brand new destinations which even to this day are some of the best we've ever gotten. The Tangled Shore was the extension to the reef we've always wanted. Ever since Destiny 1 we wanted to explore the shores of the reef, see what's out there. And with Forsaken, we got to do just that. Asteroids tethered together, enemy hideouts, mysteries around every corner, and truly just a beautiful location. We also got the Dreaming City, the endgame patrol zone that was filled with secrets. And to quote Bungie, it's as if the Dreadnought in the Vault of Glass had a baby, left it on the doorstep of Peter Jackson, and raised it on his own. The Dreaming City was an awoken homeworld, having awe-inspiring architecture, magical crystal caves, and towering mountain ranges. The Dreaming City would also be where most of the post-campaign content would lie. Things like the Petrovenge missions that would send you to discover more secrets in the Dreaming City, and would end with us communicating with Mara Sav through the Oracle and some more secret missions that had us entering the Taken Throne world. And like Bungie promised, the Dreaming City was dynamically changing. Each week, the Taken Corruption would get worse after the curse cycle began, after Riven was killed in the raid. And not only would the Dreaming City look different, but new quests, public events, and secrets would open up each week of the cycle. Also on the Dreaming City, we would get another public event style horde mode similar to Escalation Protocol, Blind Well. It was fun, but not near as good as Escalation Protocol. It might have had a better reception if there were some more incentives to run the activity. It didn't have its own unique armor set or weapons like Escalation Protocol, which was a bit of a shame. You still got loot, but it was just the Dreaming City weapons and armor, which were great on their own, but you could get that loot from any activity on the destination. Forsaken also brought us the first ever dungeon to the game, the Shattered Throne. A three-man mini raid-like experience filled with bosses, puzzles, and secrets. The reception to the Shattered Throne was overwhelmingly positive. The dungeon experience was a perfect middle ground between strikes and raids, and would prove to be a very important piece of content for the future of the franchise following its success. The only shame about Shattered Throne was like Blindwell, it also didn't have its own weapons and armor sets, with the exception of the Wish Ender exotic bow. And finally, Last Wish, the most expansive raid in Destiny history. 
Now Bungie did a lot of hyping this raid up prior to release and they absolutely did not under deliver at all with this one. The Last Wish raid succeeded for a number of reasons. Number one being its direct tie into the narrative of the expansion. This is something Tiggin King and Rise of Iron did really well with their raids, but with D2 Vanilla, Leviathan was still Cabal themed but there was no mention of Kallus in the game prior to hopping aboard the Leviathan. He was hinted at in a collector's edition book and that was it, so it felt a bit disconnected, until we finally pieced things together a bit later in the lore. And the raid layers for both Curse of Osiris and Warmind continued the Kallus story and were not themed around their expansion content at all. Last Wish would correct this issue by being a massive quest to save the Dreaming City. Saving the corrupted tech witches, defeating champions, unlocking the vault to Riven, and finally defeating Riven and destroying her heart. She was the one who possessed Aldrin to begin with and set off the events of the entire expansion. Riven was a badass villain, and Last Wish was a badass raid. The encounters were the most complex we'd ever seen, and the challenge to complete it was the highest it's ever been. Worlds First took over 18 hours to complete, and only two teams have the 24 hour emblem. I mean, whatever they did, we uh, didn't do it in the first day. Feels bad. Literally too but you guys, you guys Last Wish would go down as probably the best raid in Destiny history. Riven legit especially was the best boss fight we'd ever had. Forsaken also brought some content for the Crucible. Four new Crucible maps, three of which have been vaulted since Beyond Light, which is a shame because they were pretty good maps. Breakthrough, a brand new game mode was added where you fought to hack each other's vaults. Sort of a tug of war style mode that bared some resemblance to Salvage from Destiny 1. It was a bit imbalanced and wasn't too popular. Bungie would remove the mode from the competitive playlist within just a few weeks and it kind of died off after that. Similar to Redrix's Claymore and Warmind Season 3, Forsaken Season of the Outlaw brought some new pinnacle weapons to chase. Luna's Howl and Not Forgotten. Luna's Howl and Not Forgotten were S tier PvP hand cannons that required quite the grind to obtain of course inside the competitive playlist, but these weapons made the grind worth it. Iron Banner would get some updates and changes, power level now matters in the game mode like they did in Destiny 1, and it would receive a brand new armor set and some weapons, as well as having bounties. Oh yes, Forsaken added bounties back to the game from Destiny 1, and they were everywhere. Trials of the Nine was shelved for now, removed from the game until Bungie could figure out what to do with it. Kinda strange, but not too many people cared since Trials was in a pretty bad spot prior to Forsaken. I would have liked to see it stick around to be honest. Give us a chance to play around with it in the new sandbox, but Bungie would go a different route as we'll discuss in a future episode. Gambit would be added into the game and would quickly become a favorite amongst players. I know, I know, we all hate Gambit now, but there was a time where everyone was loving this mode. Gambit brought four maps on release, two of which have been vaulted, rest in peace Cathedral of Stars you were my favorite, and there was so much to work towards in Gambit. It had its own armor set, nine exclusive weapons, the dredgen title to earn, and the malfeasance exotic weapon which required you to kill a rare version of a primeval, the meatball as he was known. He had an incredibly rare spawn rate so the pressure was on if you were lucky enough to fight him. I grinded the hell out of Gambit, I'm talking five or six hours almost every night. A fully complete game mode that was a great addition to Destiny and another pillar for the core activities. Forsaken brought a bunch of exotics, 12 exotic weapons, 4 of which were Destiny 1 weapons, and 12 exotic armor pieces, all of which were brand new. Forsaken exotics were another upgrade compared to the previous Destiny 2 exotics. Most of them were overpowered, which was imbalanced but was fun. And that's really what's important here. The game was fun again. Exotics were actually exotic again. Loot was in a much better spot now. Forsaken brought a massive world loot pool refresh, accompanied by random rolls to weapons and armor. And I think it goes without saying how much good this does for replayability for the game. Leveling became a bit grindier. Infusing your armor was expensive. Enhancement cores, legendary shards, planetary materials, all of it was required to infuse. So you had to pay a bit more attention to what you wanted to infuse and thereby made leveling matter a bit more, which was a good thing. 
Core activities and endgame quests would now provide you with powerful gear drops that would give you those higher power level drops. A core system change that would stand the test of time as it's still what we have in the game today, save a few tweaks and changes. The weapon slot change gave players ultimate freedom over how they wanted to play, and most players chose to play like the Destiny 1 system. One primary, one secondary, and one heavy. But the options were there to mix and match how you wanted. There was much less focus on Eververse. It was still there, but much less intrusive. The Prismatic Matrix allowed you to get most of the new items, so at Forsaken launch, Eververse was tolerable. Forsaken was not just a success, but an absolute slam dunk. It was make or break for Bungie in a similar way that Taken King was for Destiny 1. But Forsaken even more so, because we'd already gone through the overhauls and changes for Destiny 1, and people didn't want to do it again unless Forsaken absolutely exceeded expectations. And thankfully, it did. Again, Forsaken was a proper sequel to Destiny 1. Destiny 2, because of the quality of life changes, basically reverted back to Destiny 1, but expanded on them with things like the weapon system, collections, triumphs, titles, and more. The sheer amount of content that came in Forsaken is still the most amount of content we've ever received in an expansion. Two destinations, four strikes, four crucible maps, 12 exotic weapons, 12 exotic armor pieces, the largest and best raid, a massive loot pool refresh, and a brand new core activity with Gambit. Forsaken was amazing and absolutely saved Destiny 2. Players were returning to the game in mass and would be looking forward. The game's foundation was better than it had ever been, and players were excited to see what would come next.